For the United States Navy, the Gerald R. Ford class was meant to mark a clean break with the past. A new generation of supercarriers designed to sustain American power deep into the 21st century. Yet two decades after the class was conceived, its second ship, the USS John F. Kennedy, CVN-79, stands as both a technical achievement and a reminder of how difficult it has become for even the most advanced Navy to build at speed. The Navy confirmed this year that Kennedy's commissioning has slipped again, now expected no earlier than March 2027. Nearly two years behind schedule, the delay will temporarily leave the United States with just 10 carriers in service, and only about half of them fully available for deployment at any given time. It is a gap that comes at a moment when America's strategic commitments are expanding, not shrinking. At Newport News Shipbuilding in Virginia, Huntington Ingalls Industries continues to push Kennedy toward completion. Earlier this year, the carrier reached a milestone with its first nuclear propulsion tests. Shipyard footage showed the immense vessel being tugged into the James River, a subtle but symbolic step, evidence that the heart of the ship is alive. The Navy reports Kennedy as roughly 90% complete. The remaining work reflects not neglect, but a decision to alter its post-shakedown availability strategy, incorporating lessons learned from the Ford's troubled introduction. The idea is to deliver a fully capable warship in one phase, rather than splitting construction into two separate handovers. Those lessons include integrating the F-35C Lightning II, improving the Enterprise Air Surveillance Radar, and refining the ship's digital architecture, all intended to reduce lifetime maintenance and crew requirements. On paper, this approach should streamline readiness. In practice, it has proven far from simple. Two systems continue to define the Ford class's growing pains, the Advanced Arresting Gear, AAG, and the Advanced Weapons Elevators, AWE. Both promise remarkable efficiency, both have struggled to deliver. Each system faced repeated integration problems on the first Ford-class ship, and, despite years of refinement, they remained bottlenecks aboard Kennedy. Combined with workforce shortages and supply chain disruptions, these issues have pushed the carrier's delivery further to the right. The Navy has considered accepting Kennedy with some non-essential work unfinished, even cosmetic elements like final painting but that would risk repeating the Ford's early service headaches. The wiser path, though slower, is ensuring full certification before sea trials begin. The delays don't end at the hull. Kennedy's future home port, Naval Base Kitsap Bremerton in Washington, is undergoing a major electrical upgrade to accommodate the Ford class's enormous power demands. Those base improvements won't finish until at least 2029. Another reminder that modern carriers require not just advanced engineering, but new infrastructure to support them. Meanwhile, the Navy faces pressure across its entire fleet. The aging USS Nimitz CVN-68 is set for retirement, while maintenance cycles for the remaining carriers often stretch well beyond planned durations. For at least a year, the Navy could find itself with fewer deployable carriers than at any point in recent memory a logistical and strategic challenge as tensions grow in the Indo-Pacific. Nowhere is that shortage felt more acutely than in the Pacific. China's People's Liberation Army Navy continues to expand at an unprecedented rate, with the Fujian Type 003 carrier undergoing sea trials and a fourth carrier already rumored to be in early construction. In contrast, the United States, which pioneered carrier aviation, is struggling to maintain a steady production rhythm. Each Ford-class ship costs more than $13 billion and takes nearly a decade to build. Even for Washington, that pace strains budgets and industrial capacity. Pentagon planners know that any gap in carrier availability directly affects deterrence. The carriers are not simply floating airfields, they are symbols of presence. When a strike group sails through the South China Sea, it projects stability, reassurance, and, when necessary, pressure. Without enough carriers ready to deploy, that message weakens. The Ford program is not a failure. Technologically, it represents enormous progress. Increased sortie rates, 
reduced crew size, and the foundation for future unmanned integration. But it also highlights the cost of innovation without sufficient testing and industrial depth. In an era where the private sector's workforce is aging and the supply chain still bears scars from the pandemic, every missed delivery date ripples across the entire defense ecosystem. The U.S. Navy's answer has been to absorb those lessons into the Kennedy and the next two ships in the class, the USS Enterprise CVN-80 and the USS Doris Miller CVN-81. If those vessels enter service closer to schedule, the Ford class will eventually deliver on its promise. But for now, the second ship remains a case study in the balance between ambition and execution. The USS John F. Kennedy carries a name steeped in history, that of a president who once championed the moon landing as proof of American resolve. It is fitting, then, that this ship's journey has become its own test of endurance. When Kennedy finally sails, she will embody more than technological power. She will represent the persistence of an industry that can still build the world's most complex warships even under strain. Yet her long road to completion is also a warning. In a world of rising challengers, time itself has become a weapon. For the United States Navy, progress on the next supercarrier is real, but it is progress measured in years, not months. And in the fast-changing Indo-Pacific, that difference matters.